Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And so it's my pleasure once again to introduce Don Syme. And while he's getting his slides up there, just to tell you that Don, like myself, is a, a native of the Southern Hemisphere, and that's why he talks funny. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> no, and, I don't. and understands the rules of cricket, which we can talk about all night to dinner, at, <coughs> if you wish. Um, but he got his doctorate at Cambridge, and he's worked at Microsoft Research for many years doing great things as of course you've heard about today. So he's going to talk to us today not about F sharp as it is, but about F sharp as it will be and can be. And this is something very, very new and I know you like me, I look forward to it immensely. Thanks John. Tom. Okay, uh, I'm on here? Okay. Right, so this is, this is work we uh, unveiled last week at um, PDC 10, which is one of the big professional developer conference, uh, one of the big Microsoft conferences in Seattle. And uh, it is, uh, we, according to Microsoft rules, we don't talk about next versions of F Sharp or so on. We talk because until we actually officially announce these things and that sort of thing, but this is, so this is talking about a future, future vision for F Sharp, but as you'll see from the demonstrations, it's a fairly concrete future vision. It's like a, a vision you can have. But vision I can have in my hands. Unfortunately, it's not a vision I can give to you today in a CTP, which will be the Microsoft Speak for Community Technology Preview, which is uh, which would be actually getting a, you know, a set of bits out there for people to use. So uh, fortunately, it's not available, but you can sit down with me uh, afterwards. Uh, I, uh, Joe might have it on, on his laptop too. Maybe he'll build it up. But uh, we can, yeah, you can sit down with me uh, at dinner and uh, do some, do some uh, um, hacking together. So, uh, right, so you've had the intro to F Sharp and all the rest, and this talk is really about a very simple idea. And uh, it's an imp I think it's an important idea. So it's an idea which will, I think, have relevance not just to F Sharp, uh, but to all the typed programming languages over time. Okay, so I'm going to, th th there's four propositions I'm going to take you through, uh, and they're all pretty, pretty simple, really. You know, it's all this, uh, I'm sure we'll all agree sort of thing, uh, that, you know, we, that there's not going to be a lot of controversy about these. So first of all, the world is information rich. We, ex we experience that information richness every day on when we use the web, when we use uh, search engines, when we use Wikipedia, when we use databases, there's this enormous fantastic quantities of information in the world and it's just growing at an unbelievable, the, you know, the data deluge is a really a true phenomenon. People talk about oceans of data and so it's undoubted that the world is just massively information rich and it's, that drives the whole computer industry. Languages don't drive the industry, it's data, you know, it's a data driven world as some, a lot of people at Microsoft like to, to say, especially the people in the data, in the data teams funnily enough. Uh, so to, to give you a perspective of, of Microsoft on that, Microsoft does actually have these two separate organizations which you think of as SQL Server on the one hand and the programming languages, Visual Studio as a product on the other. So we really do make a split between programming and, and data and there's always a lot of work to bridge this, this divide and this is part, uh, part of the tradition of, of that work. The second proposition is that modern applications are information rich. Now applications have of course been always been information rich. You think of so some of the Microsoft ones, Excel, for example, but uh, Excel or Microsoft Word, but it's a very, very um, generic form of da data. A document is a very generic form of data. Um, what, what I mean by this is that applications are, are now more and more tied to specific sources of information. Uh, everybody here who's got a, 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 a modern phone, uh, uh, be it an Android or, or Windows phone or an or, or a iPhone or whatever, knows the, that those applications are often tied to very specific data sources that are, or they're, they're bringing in multiple data sources to, to give specific data sources like feeds for traffic feeds, for example, to build a traffic, traffic 
application plus a geolocation feed, and you're putting these two things together to build an application based on specific sets of data. Okay, the third proposition is our languages are information sparse. Okay, if you look at the C Sharp, they, they are frameworks for describing information uh, and for manipulating it, but they, if you look in the C Sharp language specification, you won't find a definition of, a, of an asteroid, for example, or a, uh, or a baseball player, or a statistics set. They, they, there's no actual sort of information in the actual languages, or nor in our actual frameworks. I, I mean, our, our languages and our frameworks tend to be information sparse. They have these very generic, uh, if you look at the .NET framework, it's got these pipes you can put together, like uh, to manipulate XML, or to manipulate text, or to uh, make web connections, or to do stream and read and write to files, and these very generic ways of manipulating information. But they're lacking, a, they're lacking sort of specific information representations for, um, for information that people do actually want to integrate into their modern, into their applications. And so the, I, the, the sort of the proposition is that this is, this is a problem and we can, we can sort of fix this in these type languages and the future of F-sharp is about fixing this. And we're going to use, it's not actually magic. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is quite magical when, when, you first, when you first experience it, the first time uh, you see the dot. It's this power, there's this, this expression at Microsoft when you say the power of the dot. Uh, that uh, you kind of wonder where did that information come from and how is it how is it being how is this working? Uh, but the, the, our, we call them magic F sharp type providers, and uh, uh, we can take a look at that. So we'll skip over this. Um, uh, we'll skip over this because we've talked about that. So imagine we've got a coding challenge. Choose your favorite strongly typed language. Uh, and we have to code up a, a library for the chemical elements. Okay, I mean, so how would you start? You're an OCaml programmer. I think, okay, let's get a book out on chemical elements or go to Wikipedia or something and seeing what is a chemical element and what properties it might have and you start to build up a record, few record types to indicate uh, the, the properties that a chemical element probably should have and then you're also part of the problem is you actually have to populate that data for the chemical elements, so you'd either start copying and pasting constants in to have a big table, which is the chemical elements table, or maybe you'd find a, a bit of XML, then you have to think about getting an XML parsing library to extract that out and populate your record fields from it. Or you'd think about uh, uh, then um, making a web request, maybe getting out your HTTP request to get some HTML and doing a bit of screen scraping from uh, Wikipedia or something to populate that data, or find some other standard data set, uh, then, of course, the problem is, you know, you need, you've got chemical elements, and then you think, oh, chemical elements have isotopes, don't they? They better be part of the model, right? So you better have an isotopes property on each chemical element. But then, you know, isotopes have discoverers, people who discovered that, and that might be of interest in the model, data model, so you better have people in this model, too. And then you think you've got people, you better record where they're born, and if you've got places, then, you know, you might need other things. You kind of, information is highly linked and, and related. And uh, it would take you, kind of take you a long time to get a, a, an object model of the chemical elements, and let alone to populate its, its data. So we're going to switch across to uh, a f um, this sort of future vision for F-sharp, version of F-sharp, uh, where we have... Uh, where we're going to in work in an inf information-rich language, okay. So, information-rich uh, environment. So we've done some uh, uh, referencing of what's called an F-sharp type provider. We've also got some scripts here, and we'll load those up, and in the usual way. And we're going to access data from a, a web provider of data. It could be th this is the F-sharp language mechanism is completely neutral between various potential providers of, of schematized data. So we've got our web data, and we'll say, well, let's, um, let's see what's there, okay? And you think, wow, man, I thought we were just gonna get the chemical elements, yeah. So you think, that's quite, that's, there's a, lot of, there's a lot, of, lot of stuff here, right? So remember, it's a race. You've just, you, you've just started, you with the information-rich programmer is, uh, is fi finding the chemical elements, and you've got to remember that other person is just beginning to think about, about writing, uh, writing their first class definition or type definition for, for chemical elements. And you say, okay, you've got chemical elements here. All right, that looks pretty good. 
probably what we want. Let's um, let's pipe those into our little little form here, just like we were doing before. All right, here come some elements. I don't recognise that first one, but uh, it's told me number 120. That must be one of those newfangled ones. Here comes some more. We've got flu fluorine down the bottom. We've got um, branchium. We've got gold. Okay, good. So it looks like we're done. Okay. So we, there we have the chemical elements strongly typed and immediately embedded into the F sharp uh, programming context as if it were just data available in your application. Okay, just to check how complete the, the model we have of the chemical elements is here, it looks like it's pretty good. Right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of types we didn't have to design here. We've just got the data immediately available and in our hands in one of okay. Right. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Now, of course, uh, we actually want to write an application because, as I said, it's not just about getting data. We are, you, modern applications are information rich. And one of the very first iPhone applications that, went, that was extremely popular was, that was a periodic table application that you had your little iPhone. You could, you, could get, you could kind of flick through the periodic table and that was making web connections, I believe, at the, at the background to get that data. So uh, let's start turning this a bit more into a uh, periodic table. So we'll start with this and we'll... Uh, so first of all, we want to sort it by... Um, so we'll do a sort by... Yeah. For each of the elements, we'll sort by the uh, atomic. Oh, that's there are all those properties we were looking at for the chemical elements. We'll sort by the atomic number. Okay, great. Okay. Just oh, there we go. Oh, we've made a type error. Okay, it turns out atomic numbers in this data model can be nullable. You think that's just crazy, right? Can't possibly be uh, an element without an atomic number. Okay, so we will uh, move this over here. Uh, but it shows we're working in str a strongly typed model of, of all of that data, okay? And we can, uh, there's a thing called on, null on nullables, uh, things which can empty, empty cells in database tables. You can do this value or default. They, they always have a default value for the, um, for the field. So we can sort by that and we'll go uh, seek dot, sorry, show grid at the end. And yeah, we'll do that. Okay, that's a bit strange to getting these ones at the top. And it turns out that if we, if we look across, it looks, it's beginning to look more like the periodic table. At least hydrogen, helium, and lithium are in the right order. But it turns out that there are actually some elements without an atomic number in this data set, which presumably is um, either a mistake in the data set or, or they're actually names for elements that haven't been discovered yet and haven't been assigned an atomic number, which is a bit, would be a bit strange. But uh, they, um, th so we actually want to start cleaning the data. It's a very, very typical problem that you're working with data sets. You need to do some uh, data cleaning, and that's why programming and, and, and data intersect. If all data was perfect and beautif beautiful, then there wouldn't be anywhere near as much intersection between programming and data as there is today. So we want to filter here by uh, make sure it actually has a value. Okay, and then we, then we show the grid. Okay. So now we're really much closer to a, uh, a periodic table application. Okay, cheat sheet down here. So uh, of course we, we may not just want to um, uh, do a, 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 an application, we may want to do a, an, an analysis of the data. So for instance, we wa might want to map over this sequence of chemical elements in atomic number order We'll get the name of the element and the, uh, the, uh, you get the isotopes of the element here. We'll get the number of isotopes, the, ca the count of the isotopes here. And instead of, uh, well, we'll take those here, we'll evaluate that. Okay, that looks good. More and more isotopes as we go up. But let's do an analysis here where we, I've got a little easy chart library here, and we'll do a, uh, a bar chart of that. A uh, column chart, actually, that's what I want. And we'll, uh, we'll bring that up. So we can see that's how the I number of isotopes vary as uh, the element, as the, as the atomic number increases. Those bars in the middle are just an artifact of the graphing, but this presumably is where you hit the, um, the radioactive elements and the number of known isotopes decreases very quickly. So, so the aim here is to make our, our languages uh, information rich. And what you've just seen is a demonstration of what I'd call language-integrated web data. 
the data source was one of these uh, one of these on, on ontologies. Uh, it's one called uh, <coughs> that we were looking at one called uh, some data drawn from Freebase. You can also draw data from uh, DBpedia. There's one called um, Factual.com, which is about providing organized data sets for mobile phone applications. And there's one, uh, Wolfram Alpha is another one, where you can uh, get a lot of data. They're not all, they're, not, they're different logical characteristics in their schematization. Uh, the ones I'm interested in here are organized data with enormous numbers of types. They're often very interlinked, and they're often using uh, Wikipedia and other content as their base information. In Wiki, the information in Wikipedia is very organized, uh, so you tend to be able to screen scrape it. You look at the panels down the right-hand side. One of the, one of the phenomena that's happening in the world is this organizing the world's data and information is being driven not necessarily by the need to program against the data, but the need to visualize the data, to automatically produce visualizations of the data. The reason why the Wikipedia data is getting more and more organized is because those panels down the right, uh, are, 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 they can use that organized data to form those panels which in visualization. And that's something you're, you're seeing, yeah, you're seeing more and more. Organization and schema is not only about programming, it's also about, about visualization and, and making sense of the data in, in visual ways. So one thing I particularly like in, in this work is that as, as people are, are working with these ma massive web ontologies, and uh, this, is, this sort of stuff has made me li like the semantic web. I mean, if the semantic web gives me this data, I'm, I'm really happy, right? This, if this is, so uh, as you're working with this data, you may be, maybe you're meant to be doing uh, chemistry but you can, and, and doing a sci an application for high school students to learn chemistry from their mobile phones, okay? It's a, a, um, a reasonable application to want to write. And you can immediately look here and the design of the, the application starts to drive itself from the data, right? You can think, okay, I'll show the elements, I'll show who discovered them, give some little biographical details about where they were from and you can kind of put the, put the pieces together. Uh, but then you might think, actually, my real interest here is, is to, uh, is, is comic books, right? And I'd actually like to, the next app I write, would, I, I'd like to write a, a com comic book app. And uh, you can kind of drive that, and you can see, see the application begins to describe itself. And on and on it goes, all the way down, uh, you can take a look at astronomy here, and et cetera. <coughs> okay, so uh, it's, data is not just about Embedding data into the programming context is not just about make it easy to access, but allow the, there's this wonderful thing about IntelliSense, the, the navigation of, the, of structured and organized data. I mean, there are other ways to navigate uh, structure, like you use search, for example. You can imagine having a little search box on these IntelliSense menus that search, you get to search the whole sub, uh, all of the astronomy tree for particular uh, bits of information. But IntelliSense as it is today, through these structured namespaces, organized namespaces, is, an inte is incredibly, powerful way of navigating. And by bringing this structure into the F-sharp type system, we are automatically leveraging all the, all the existing ways we have of working with strongly typed things, okay? So one, uh, one way, for example, um, that w there, there's a lot of metaphors we already have in programming that you will also want to apply to these to the external, the world of organized external data. We think of types as being a, th a way to control the complexity internal to application. This is about saying types are about encountering the outside world, encountering schematized information on the outside, uh, outside our application. So, so there's a, huge, ma a massive tidal wave of organized data in the world, and typed languages have to have to be able to participate. We have to apply the, apply the benefits of types to the, to the world of organized information. <coughs> so how would you go and do this today in a strongly typed language? Well, you'd go and you know, Google, uh, Google around or search around on the web for um, uh, how to you access the REST API for data service provider such and such, right? And you would put together some pieces and you'd have to start serializing your data into your record types. You can see some uh, .NET serialization data here for getting the chemical elements here. You'd have to manually write out this code for every data set you wanted to access. You'd then have to learn this kind of code. And this is the code to do the equivalent of data, web data dot chemistry dot chemical elements, okay? It's about a thousand times harder and I think would take you about 
about a thousand times longer to write this code. Really, a factor of a thousand difference in a standard routine programming problem that programmers have to do every day in different kinds of application development against specific kinds of data, data sources. You have to, the things you have to know here, you have to uh, know all about web requests, you have to know all about the particular strings you need to pass to a query language down here, you have to know about serialization, or, or this is a bit of generic code for generic serialization, it's quite nicely written. But it's a lot, it's a lot you have to know, and it's, uh, um, it's, you have to be quite a good programmer to be able to do this kind of work. So the magic is that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're not tying F# -sharp to any particular web, any particular data source or notion of schematized data. Instead, we're opening up uh, F# -sharp one extension point in the F# -sharp language where you get to reference a type provider instead of reference a library. And a, a library uh, offers a finite set of types and functions, types and modules, and a provider offers basically an, an inf potentially computed space of types. So it's a provider sits there mediating to some external data, schematized data source, and provides a universe of types into the language. And so far we've seen that applied to web, to, 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 to web based data. So the idea is you have data and services at your fingertips that it scales to millions of types if necessary, millions of named types. Uh, you, th that it ties in with navigation and IntelliSense and that it integrates with a story for querying these external data sources. We have a link as a wonderful standard in .NET where you, uh, this is a perfect complement to link because you just describe your queries over those data sets and the query will be taken and actually run on that server rather than being run in your, um, in your in, uh, rather than dragging the whole database tables to your local machines. A and most specifically, we're trying to kill off this endless reliance on code generation uh, but to mediate between you, the programmer, and the outside world. Because that's how it's generally done today, is people, s people spit a huge amount of code, uh, which they then check into their source tree, and then that code goes out of date, and, and then they, somebody goes and edits that code and makes a bug fix, and then it gets refreshed, and it's like round and round and round. And code gen is one of the main problems. Uh, in, in practical programming today. The, uh, the providers are just references here. You just reference them like any other uh, DLL. Um, so they, they, they are labeled uh, in, internally in, in the, as being a, a type provider instead of a DLL, instead of a library. And uh, you just simply reference the provider that, and then the compiler instantiates an instance of the provider and uses that to provide the types into the into the type checking. They're small, so one of the ones we'll be looking at in a bit, the Microsoft.Management.Type Provider, uh, which provide, we'll, we'll take a look at what that, that in a little bit, but uh, that's a, a, a tiny thing, but the amount of information that that's bringing into your, into your programming context in a strongly typed way is, is enormous. So in, in one sense, all we're doing is something very simple, which is taking the symbol table and saying, let's make the symbol table be computed at compile time that it's actually not just a fixed set of symbols defined locally in your program or just the libraries you've, you've accessed, but allow that to be uh, computed and uh, at, uh, to computed statically and give a consistent architecture for uh, providing types into the compilation process. So there's a little API for type providers. It's very simple. It's what I like is that the first line represents the static semantics of the data source you're connecting to. Uh, I remember we were basically in that, in that first example of web data taking a good slice of the world's, the, the entire, the net sum of human knowledge, right? Because that, that, that particular web data does represent a vast repository of information and knowledge. And we're shoveling it all through this particular function here, the static semantics, giving the static semantics to names. And this function here is giving the dynamic semantics about how to actually, what code should we actually generate at the call sites to each of these whenever we actually get the chemical element data, what do we actually have to emit as our, as our runtime semantics? Plus there's a couple of uh, extra hooks here to invalidate in case the uh, provider, the, the assumptions of the provider have changed and get types is for, for, for extra navigation. So they're simple to implement. Uh, the, the, one of the ones we'll look at in a bit is only 130 lines of code. 
on top of a simple, simple shared library. And they just map information sources into the .NET type system. So f -sharp still doesn't contain any, any data. This, the idea is there'll be an open architecture. You can write your own type provider uh, against if you have some uh, schematized s sources to, pr to project into the programming context. And there's many, many interesting applications of this. Uh, basically, every single person I talk to comes up with, as part of the conversation of showing it, it says, wow, we could use this for that. Take a typical example in these uh, customer relation management systems. So major, major pro uh, computer uh, software products um, like SAP or Microsoft Navision and other, um, other major products that are used inside organizations. These, uh, these keep schematized information with the metadata in, in lots and lots of uh, tables associated with the software. And people generate massive amounts of code to be able to do strongly typed access to be able to program up uh, applications against the information in an organization. The, uh, it would seem straightforward, in a sense, that that can be applied, that this mechanism can be applied to just simplify that process of just working directly with uh, CRM-based data. And I didn't know, I, I mean, I had vaguely thought about this application uh, and thought of going and talking to the people inside Microsoft, but recently it's quite clear just talking to some people at PDC that that's uh, it's a, a very good use of, of this mechanism. So I want to give a, a, an, another example. Uh, it's actually a slightly Microsoft-related one. Uh, there's a thing called the Azure, uh, data, mar the Azure data Market. Uh, and uh, it's an example of this class. There's a class of type providers which are about, uh, about embedding directories of information into, um, in, in, into an application into the programming context. So we, uh, we go over to Windows Azure, which is a cloud-based hosting uh, from, uh, from Microsoft. Uh, uh, sorry, a set of cloud services from, from Microsoft. Uh, we go to the marketplace. Uh, there's a marketplace. And in the marketplace, there's some people selling, uh, doing data. Okay, Presumably, there will eventually be other bits and pieces in the, the marketplace. And we see, well, what's in the data market? We wander over to the data market. We think, OK, what's there? OK, there's some data sets. That's pretty cool. So you can see. We're navigating through to the actual data sets that are available on this. We haven't, we have, I mean, we haven't, at this point, we haven't even necessarily even signed up to, uh, to you, you eventually need an application key and so on to work with uh, the, the, the data from this, from this data market. Uh, and in some cases, you, you need to pay for the data. There are some high value uh, live feeds of like uh, sporting games and other statistics. Uh, that, that come through these, these data sets. So they're live data sets, they're not necessarily fixed ones. And, um, but we're able to navigate and explore and, now, and check out the, the schemas of these data sets uh, even before we've actually used them. So you can see we can come here and um, start. This, this, uh, marks, the data market was just announced uh, recently. You can see. Um, that there's uh, quite a number of good data sets that are available, available here. OK, so let's go to the statistics data sets. Uh, this, uh, many of the statistics data sets are free for use. So unlimited, as I understand it, unlimited queries. Uh, um, uh, you, just, you can just sign up and get an application key, and they're, they're free for use. And there's a lot of interesting programming you can do against these. So it uh, turns out the, we'll, we'll use the crime data that, that comes first. So let's uh, tidy this up. We'll open up the data market and we'll uh, let our data set uh, crime data equal data set statistics.crime. Now under here, we're, we're, we're looking at ways to clean this up a little bit. You do have to, uh, the API that's under each particular data set is what's uh, called a code generated o data, uh, o uh, code generated way of using an o, what's called an OData, open data uh, um, uh, data standard. Uh, and you do have to give your credentials at this point. Where this credentials is defined in this little app key script up here. And that's just a, uh, a credentials that you get from the, um, from the, the Azure data market. So let's go across to that Azure data market. And this is the, the website that we're, sort of logically speaking, getting all the data from. You can see this is the data set that we're accessing here. Uh, I'll sign in here. OK, so that's signed in. It knows about me now. 
And uh, you can sign up. Here's a subscription. This doesn't cost anything because, as I said, it's a free, totally free data set. Uh, you can also explore the data here using a pa PowerPoint Pivot for Excel or uh, uh, Tableau. Or uh, if you want to use it from C Sharp today, you actually have to download a piece of C Sharp code that you actually have to paste into your application and maintain as the API to access that data set. Uh, so what we're doing is, in a sense, eliminating all of those intermediary code generation steps so you don't ever see what that, if there's code generation going on under the hood, you certainly don't see it. Okay, let's load this up here. Okay. All right, so now we've got our crime data. Uh, there's this. The, the next menu is a little bit more complex than we uh, than we want. The in fact, the, the the one we want is just the city crime data, and we can do the same thing we were doing before, where we do a show grid on the uh, on the city crime here, and we've got the statistical data set. And uh, you know, there's a lot of applications you can. I mean, crime statistics are important, and you can start to build applications and analyses based on 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 this information here. Uh, this is the, the, the first hundred elements of the data set come down by default. Right, so again, we might want to do some uh, statistics and visualization of, of this data here. So let's um, bring up this down here. A little bit of code. I'll just make it that that doesn't, uh, if you can see what's being done here, that it's the, it's not called data set, it's called crime data. Nice and strongly typed that we're taking the uh, burglary per head of population and the aggravated assault per head of population and seeing if there's a correlation. Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, there's an invalidation signal that can come back from the provider. So that this, the characteristics of, in a sense, the soundness characteristics of working with these data sets and the strongly typed projections of data depend a lot on the actual data, on the characteristics of the ultimate provider of the data. So there are some, uh, many cases where you can pick up a change signal in a schema, okay? And you can, be co you can also be polling for that change schema, a change, uh, it might be a change number on the schema or the like. And you can send an invalidate signal back to the, certainly the static typing context, and that'll just cause everything to be retype checked, right? Uh, there, so we have examples of working with Excel in a strongly typed way. So you're getting the columns and stuff out of the Excel spreadsheet, and you should go and change the spreadsheet, and it automatically updates Visual Studio, for example. Uh, there are also cases where invalidation is not, not possible. Uh, there are other cases, where in which case you, you lose a sort of soundness guarantee. You might. Um, there are other cases where you want to, uh, ideally, you'd have an intermediate representation, that you, so you don't have to be connected to compile against uh, some some data source, and that we're also uh, that's, we're also looking at that issue as part of the architecture of um, of, of, of the mechanism. Uh, so this work exposes you to data issues. It, it exposes the programmer language to certain data issues of versioning and schema, uh, and mapping things into into type systems and so on that you wouldn't. Uh, nor that I find actually quite exciting, right? Because you suddenly many of the type system things that researchers have worked on, like say security types or right, things like that suddenly become much more relevant because we can have these components that automatically project that information, uh, you know, verified, presumably verified components or verifiable components that project that information into the programming language context. Because it's clear that the security information is never actually going to be stored in code, right? It's actually going to be associated with documents uh, or the originally. So I know this topic is close to your, yeah, it's close to your heart in, in what you guys have been doing too. Uh, Okay, so I'll finish up with the, um, uh, the, the scatter chart on this data for this part of the, the work here. So this is, for instance, uh, showing correlations between certain uh, between aggravated assault and burglary in different uh, different cities, mostly in in Alaska, um, because that's the start of the data set. Okay. Great. So. Uh, the, yeah, that's Windows Azure. Uh, just there are, there are, as I said, it's neutral. The, the language mechanism is neutral, but has many, many interesting applications to making connections with, with things such as, as this. Okay, so to say, yeah, we mediate today. Microsoft, uh, as I said, there's these generic plumbing uh, tools such as web requests and XML readers and uh, 
JSON parsers and SQL readers. And we get objects and strings and bytes back from that, and it's all untyped and non-navigable. That's one way of doing things. Uh, the other is to move to a completely untyped language, to move to JavaScript. And actually, a lot of this stuff looks fine in JavaScript, right? The, because in JavaScript, you feel like you're, you're working with an information-rich language because it's got the web uh, right available, and it's kind of well set up to be doing web requests. The web feels a lot further away when you're working with C Sharp for some, or, or F Sharp, and it's trying to we're bridging that gap in that with and getting keeping all the benefits of, of types. So uh, the other way we mediate today is by doing enormous amounts of code generation. Microsoft loves code generation. We have lots and lots of tools inside Visual Studio which do code generation, and it does it. They do them well. They do them as well as it can be done, and uh, that we use this to take uh, to get strongly typed view. Battery low, okay. Uh, yes, we get strongly typed views of resources associated with your application, of OData feeds for feeds coming from all sorts of, um, all sorts of services like uh, uh, SharePoint or web, web, web data and a, a free, um, Facebook has OData feeds or Netflix and other ones. And databases as well, we've always done a lot of code generation. So that's uh, okay, but it's got problems, okay? We generate too much code. Some of these, uh, some of these um, ontologies or web data stores are just enormous, okay? You have really 30,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 interlinked types. And you go start with one type and you end up with the whole thing, right? There's no, because it's relating everything to everything else in a structured and organized way, then it gets very, very big to generate those types. So we, the, Code generation has fundamental problems. There's a lot of cases where code generation generates APIs that are so big that the residue code like doesn't fit in a mobile phone application, and you have to start kind of cutting out all the stuff you don't need, which has all sorts of other other problems. Okay, so so uh, to to show the kind of surprising applications of this technique, and uh, again, this is just one where we. Someone on the F# -sharp team happened to be an expert in what's called Windows Management Instrumentation, which is a it's, it's part of a common standard for accessing information about machines on on networks, corporate networks normally. So a standard job inside a corporate network is to go and find all the machines that have a particular dodgy disk drive. Okay, because we bought a batch of a hundred of them and they just stop they stop working, and we need to go and get rid of those machines and find out the serial numbers where they're located and go and uh, go and fetch them and, and change their disk drives, okay? Uh, so it's a sort of API where you can go and query that information about machines on your, on your network. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's the bread and butter of what's called PowerShell programming, or one of the main uses of PowerShell inside organizations. Uh, PowerShell is loved because it's just one of these uh, un, uh, loose, dynamically typed languages which, um, which just make Again, you feel in those dynamically typed languages that you're working in an information-rich language because they're kind of set up to emit, to have all of that projection, that, all of that information projected into the the language um, uh, very very easily. So uh, in this setting, we're going to use a, a a type provider which provides all of the management information on my local machine here uh, as a set of uh, navigable types. So we've got our local machine. I'll, I'll type through it from the top here, so we get rid of this. So we have our, our, our local machine here, and in this would also you'd also be able to navigate other machines on the network, and perhaps have some standard machines like a Linux machine. What's available? Linux Ubuntu machine. What's available on that? A Windows 7 machine. What's available on that? And there'll be there'll be commonality between those as well. And here we have uh, and this will have all the different information that's associated. And as you can see, there's a lot of information, uh, just schematized information, just available on my local machine. We're not talking the web or anything here. We're just talking about what have people bothered to organize on my local machine. You could never generate, or you wouldn't generate a .NET API for all of this, right? This is sort of too much information, which gives you the feeling that even on the local machine, the amount of actual information, uh, organized information, is, is enormous. Uh, you, you, uh, there are the disk drives. I won't try and uh, uh, so there's Win32 disk drive down here, and you could iterate over the disk drives and find out their, their characteristics. I'll, I'll, I'll risk that in a little bit because that's going off script. So uh, the, let's open up this namespace here. Here's just a little script down below uh, to show 
that uh, we're, we can iterate, say, the operating system on the machines. Uh, there's, uh, there we go. And we can find out the logical characteristics of the operating, uh, of the operating system. Uh, as you can just see all the different things that we can look. And these are li often live data feeds as well. So we can listen to the events happening in, in an operating system on a particular machine. Okay. Great. So lots and lots of information here, and we can, uh, and all, and I said strongly typed, so if we make a mistake here in, the, in typing, then we get told that actually the operating system just doesn't have that property. And we haven't, ac it's not dynamic, this is doing static type checking against a schema of the information that we're accessing. Okay. So let's uh, load that up. Accessing the schema for the first time down in the session below. Let's just give it a while. There we go. That's the operating system coming back. Off Windows 7. Uh, we can also say access the the, 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 the the processors and get some information about it. Uh, just, just or find out what BIOS version is installed on on my machine. Uh, and then we could once we have this, we could then uh, iterate across a um, set of machines in the network on the assumption that they've all got the same shape and so using the local machine as a template. We could then do an iteration across the machines on the network to find out what data is available there. So uh, to, to summarize, uh, the, it's a simple talk. Uh, uh, just imagine if we could, from our programming language context, uh, access web data, data markets, WMI, Active Directory, and strongly typed and without explicit code gen, extensible and open. And because it's extensible and open, imagine spread programming against spreadsheets as if the data was part of our application. Web services, uh, uh, <coughs> so you can, uh, there, there, are, there are many good projections of web services into .NET and into, into type systems. CRM data or social data. So you can just work with uh, the, say the Facebook data, data graph, uh, as you um, just, just directly and in a strongly typed way. And uh, S SQL, the traditional form of data in an in a enterprise XML. And on and on it goes. So the solution for us is called uh, type providers. And uh, so in summary, the world is incredibly information rich and our languages need to be, have the mechanisms to be information rich too. And my, some one, one of the tag lines I like to use is like that, if the world has oceans of data, then you need a language that can sail on that or can swim in those oceans of data, right? And is not, is not sunk by it. So the, F, the future of F-sharp is to allow you to consume data directly in a, without throwing out the types, so strongly typed, and to break down the walls between you and these data sources. And so uh, that's, that's really all I have to say on that. So questions? Yep. So that so so obviously something obviously something happened here, right? Yeah. What what happened to strong typing, right? Yeah. What happened to uh, type soundness and guarantees? Yeah. Right. So that depends. You're exposed to data characteristics. Okay. If your spreadsheet is part of your application and is not going to change, then you've got a soundness guarantee. Okay. Many of these data sources, uh, there's there soundness is being dealt with on the data side. We're exposed to this problem whenever we interact with data anyway, right? The fact that any version of this, whenever you're ac interacting, is ex you're, so you're exposed to the, the problem. But the, d the soundness is on the data side, in a sense. So if, if you look at some of these data providers like Freebase, they have a magic little number there, at date, okay, where you can specify the date, a timestamp of both. In this case, you're timestamping both the schema and the data. And then you fix, you fix that. And the, 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 you'll get a constant frozen view of that data. Never, you'll, you can, you, it's always going to be there. So you, you, in that case, you get a soundness guarantee when working with that data once you put an at date. So uh, you'll be able to, one of the things about providers is that given the data source, you can project that same data source in multiple different ways with and without the at date parameter. So you can program against it fluently, getting the latest data you want. Then you want to lock, then you want to lock down. And you lock down your references to being the at date 1st of October 19. In, uh, not, uh, 2010 or something like that. So where, where does then the code gen break down? If, if I'm 
So we don't, because you can't code gen these things, right? You can't code gen Freebase because there's too many types. There's, it's, it's, it's 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 types. You cannot, you cannot code gen that, yeah. No, no, that's the, at the very the top level namespaces, so it's efficiently broken down and organized into a structure that you never have to iterate all 30,000 types. So it's a lazy exploration of a computer set of types. It's, uh, yeah, I think there's, de there's, there's, a, there's a definite relation between that you don't have to, well, for any particular process, no, not really, because every particular source program only needs a certain number of types, right? It doesn't have to, if you're, not, if you're going to explore all 50,000 types, then yeah, you, it's, you're, what's that? Why don't I just down well, that's effectively, you can think that's what we're doing, but how would you know which ones the program is going to use? Then uh, that's what the architecture is doing. That's it's, except we're not code genning at all for that particular case because there's an erasure model where those types don't get code gen at all, right? Because you couldn't code gen them anyway because they're so interlinked. Right, you'd have to only, it's, their properties are interlinked, like the isotopes leads you to other things, leads you to other things. You'd actually have to delete those off as well, right? So you are, it, it's very difficult to code gen your way out of the problem, right, in for, for, for modern, uh, and this applies inside the enterprise as well, the inside businesses. They have APIs that are, uh, are massive. They, they, the code generation, and anyway, code generation is just a disaster because you, you might, People check it into their source code tree. People go and edit it. It gets all out of whack. It's just an artificial mechanism to mediate, to do what we're doing here, to mediate between you and the data. It has all the same problems of schema change as, uh, as, a, as data has. It, 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 it only makes your problems worse. Yeah. All right. the, 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 yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. So I think this, all from my point of view, reveals the dark side of object oriented programming, <laughs> which is that object oriented programming. No, that no, that's not true. They're, they're, they're double backticks, which is the name in F sharp, the way in F sharp of giving a. These aren't strings. These are. This is a way of giving a name in F sharp, which includes a space. So it's like an automatic yeah, it's a symbol. It just happens to have a space in it. Yeah, so 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 it's it's it's, it's strongly typed, right? If I do this, so I'll get. Yeah, I think you're, I think, I, I'm, I'm not such a critic of uh, the data models being used here. They are, they are projecting relationships between entities that are quite reasonable for humans to expect to exist. It's okay to expect a discoverer property on an atomic, on a, on a chemical element. And it's okay to expect a birth location on a, on a, on a, um, uh, <coughs> uh, on a, on a uh, discoverer and etc. Uh, these are perfectly reasonable relations and perf perfectly reasonable to have. Now, they offend uh, some, some ethic we have in core computer science, which is that not ev you don't want everything to be interlinked, because when you interlink everything, we, we know we kind of run into all sort of problems. But the people who are organizing the world's data right, uh, are interlinking everything because they're reasonable relations to have. I mean, it exposes you to data issues, without a doubt, in the sense that data people like to give relations between things and they don't carve things up into the base library of chemical element data with the add-on extras that you're, if you want location information, you have to reference location information. It, it, it doesn't work like that. They just relate things and give, uh, and give object models for, for well, give, uh, yeah, give, give simple, very, very, these are very simple uh, uh, um, relational models between this, this data. Uh, so I think that's fine because we have to work with this, with this kind of data. I mean, you, you've got no chance of finding uh, a simpler 
presentation in the sense of this of this data. Yeah. yeah. So this seems very exciting. I spend all my days uh, working with data and dynamic languages like R, you know, really excel. And every time I see somebody yes. trying to do this with a static language, it just looks horrendous to me yes. as a, somebody who spends all yes. my time in a dynamic language. Yeah. But one thing I'm trying to understand is I basically never open a data set without immediately manipulating it and adding columns to it, uh, cleaning up data. You know, yep. you may have a, you know, you may have income and then you want to take the log of income yep. and I, I don't really want it to, I don't, I'm just trying to understand how this, you know, do I do dot log income or do I, am I going to have another variable that's not, no longer attached to that data set? Uh, um, you, you would, you would do just a lot of F sharp programming, right? So you'd just start, you know, writing, let, uh, let. Uh, no, it's still null here. Yeah. That's why we had to do this one here. Yeah, right. So, so it's still it's still chemical elements coming through here. No, I know. So, but the right way, if I was doing this with just simple records, would be to define another record type that says that that's not null and and map the data from the the less refined type to the more. Yes. Refined Yes. So that that's right. So this provider model is there are many interesting applications of it, and one is where you have types computed from other types. Okay, such as the non uh, one where, so pivots are one very interesting application area. You have a scientific data set and you want to do the R, R style pivots on, uh, on the data set in a strongly typed way. And there's no reason why the provider can't compute a set of nominal types that are related to the original type. There's, it's always computing nominal types in a setting. Uh, and uh, that uh, can also be applied to sort of Logically, it doesn't. Logically speaking, the joins of various types are of, are available, right? Uh, that because these cogenerations can't can't no cogeneration strategies can't uh, create the types that represent all the possible joins. But a type provider, in a sense, can create the types that represent the logical joins of a structure. Yeah. This sounds incredibly powerful and elegant, and I'm just having a, a basic issue with. It seems to me I can write a program that type checks tomorrow, and the same program won't type uh, yep. type checks today. That won't type check yes, tomorrow. You're if you if you're if you're against the schema, and that's against for every single uh, program that interacts with typed external schema where the schemas change, mm -hmm. you're exposed to that data today. You can write a program that does query on a web API mm -hmm. that works inside your inside your university network and won't work on the outside of the university. network. And the network. difference is if I do it and today, yes. if, if I do that using not this technique. It means I'm going to get a runtime error. You just get a runtime error. And if and I do it this way, yes, it, it, you are exposed. I'm get a runtime ty type error. Your type assumptions are, uh, become different. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, that's totally part of the package. It depends on the provider. It depends on the data source. There are many ways to tie that down. To be a good story, mm -hmm. we've talked about some of those. But uh, you know, I've had so, so some that's of these. Correct. I'm, I'm getting this correct. That, that, you're that getting that correctly. That's right. You're, ex you're exposed to schema change issues. And there you are, you're basically choosing to reveal that in a static way for when you either recompile your program. And I said where an important part of the architecture is to make sure you can take a local copy to pr of, the, of the information so you don't have to be, at least don't have to be connected to build, even if the schema hasn't changed. You can still compile your application. Yeah. So I'm probably going to figure out the answer to my question as I pose it. But very, very crudely, what's going on here is you have a plugin to the compiler to generate types, which is talking to a database during compilation to yep. work out the schema or talking to some source. Yep. And then you have a runtime library, which knows how to resolve whatever's written in the bytecode and actually pull the data and return it in what we've yeah, seen the, so the, the, the first component gives a residue for, for uh, gives the erasure of semantics for the type, how to actually run things at yeah. runtime. Yep. So my question is, instead of just generating data and then presenting it in, all, all, you sh all I've seen so far is presenting data in existing library containers. So you're presenting things in sequences. Yep. Can our data types ch automatically uh, kind of, can you generate behaviors? Could yes, you make something yes, that so at runtime could yeah. emit code and generate whole new objects and dynamically yes, generate? Yes, yes, well, there's two, th two things you can things. do. You can have a write back story. I mean, most of the code generation story uh, things have also a write back API. In fact, this one here does uh, let you write back. Uh, you write back in a these add objects and add to city crime and so on. Uh, let's you 
right back to that data set. Uh, the, um, I've forgotten the other thing I was going to say. The, uh, what was the other? Uh, it was, can you generate really quite, could you have your things actually generate code to generate really quite arbitrary behaviors? Yes, so I've given sequences, lazy sequences mm -hmm. as the sort of container types for data. There's no reason why you can't have all the other .NET types that represents like events coming back, so it's a push model of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can uh, have the, quer the queryable ones to, to do link queries over a data source. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, .NET kind of comes with a good, rich vocabulary of, of behavior, behavioral types for, for, co for connections. Uh, okay, yeah, and, and then and just these coming back. One can I add one just very quick? So just one very quick final thing on that. Yeah. Is it at the compiler level a check what the, uh, I mean, I know with the IntelliSense you're presenting things, but is it very much a check what the, what the user has written to make sure it's in the schema? Or could the user start just inventing field names? I, well, no, not hope that they happen, but have, have the model that, um, I'm thinking not connecting to a database, but maybe say I want to output some kind of unstructured data that doesn't have a schema. Yeah. Could I just start inventing field names and have the thing build it up so I could start the doing you know, x equals new. Right, so way. that, so C sharp and F sharp both have features which match that. They're both these dynamic features which, okay. uh, which just let you put a, uh, I mean they're very, they're, tri they're, they're quite simple features to, to, to let you say that some objects actually w effectively have symbols turned into strings automatically. Okay. Uh, so that, but that's totally un, untyped. Which is this is about trying to preserve typing. But through could the you invent yeah. that in a typed way with using this? Uh, could so you invent that in a typed so way? So I couldn't that use it in be, two different. I think that would that the, 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 where the schema is actually implied by how the thing is built up in the program that wouldn't be covered by this. Part of the magic, I think, of your presentation, which makes it look so simple, is that you've very smartly convinced a whole bunch of other people to write these data providers for you. So, well, at the beginning no, of your talk, yeah, we've written the providers, but they've oh, done the schemas and they've done the data. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. right. So, at the beginning of your talk, is oh, this is really hard code, and and look, now you don't have to write this anymore. That's because yeah. you've written it it for me. We've right? written it once for all. For yeah. certain. For, for for a certain class of a whole class of of, of, of schema definition languages, yeah. for yeah. example. Okay, yeah. and okay, cool. Okay, great. great. Thanks. Um, seven years ago, I was in Edinburgh in June, and so was Don, and I heard him speak about putting generics into C sharp. So it reminds me so much of that, Don, of that time, and how far we've come, and that was also a data race. And here <laughs> we've got another data race, and I'm looking forward to where we'll be in another seven years' time when this is what we do all the time, and Don's on to the next best thing. Kay. Thanks, Don. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. delighted to have our lock note, which is a word I learnt the other night, as opposed to keynote. And that means that we're at the last talk of the day, which is going to um, bring us to the end of this wonderful day about F sharp in education. And we've got Howard Mansell from Credit Suisse, who's come up from New York, not all the way from Switzerland. And he's going to tell us about the use of F sharp in his bank.
Okay, so uh, functional programming is actually relatively common in the quant functions in finance. Um, not, you know, not all over the place, certainly, but there are quite a few shops that uh, use various kinds of functional programming. Um, and this talk is going to be about the journey that I and our group went through learning about functional programming um, in general while trying to improve the technology platform for the group. Uh, this culminated in the use of F Sharp, uh, which is why the title of my talk is F Sharp and Education. Um, but it's really applicable to um, the mix of functional programming and, and object-oriented programming. Um, I think this is kind of applicable in, in a bunch of different uh, languages. So f I'm going to talk for a little while about you know, what we do, why we do it, how we learned this, um, uh, what we have learned, and hopefully there'll be some material in there that can help you uh, justify um, teaching functional programming or F Sharp or some combination thereof. <clears throat> um, and then I'm going to do a little kind of demo of some F Sharp features that we use uh, quite, quite frequently. But first of all, a little bit of background. Um, as I said, we're quantitative strategies. We're the modeling and quant analysis team at Credit Suisse. So um, uh, you may have, some people may have seen uh, previous talks I've done on the, uh, on the web. And our pre previous name for our group was Global Mod Modeling and Analytics Group. <clears throat> so what our group does is build uh, models for pricing, valuation, risk analysis, and market, an market analysis, and tools that expose those models to our users. So the tools will be some kind of application the user can, can go to and interact with our model. The model is just some calculation and usually consuming uh, some amount of data. Uh, what we also do is work with trading desks to analyze trading opportunities, risk exposure, et cetera. I'm not really going to talk about that. So how do we do it? This, that's what this talk is about. So. All right, so um, in our, um, we basically have two kinds of user-facing product, tools and books. So tools are the kind of things I've talked about that someone will bring up to, to analyze or price a particular trade. A book is a, um, uh, a trading book that where, where a trader will uh, look at their positions, uh, they'll be able to value them, analyze risk, et cetera. Uh, and we use this also, the, these books run for, for regulatory reporting purposes as well. We have to kind of report that, as well as internal risk management. <clears throat> uh, so how do we do this? So initially, our group started out in a slightly different form, roughly speaking about 15 years ago in the sort of relatively early days of derivatives. And the solution we came up with was Excel. This was before my time. Um, so just to give a bit of context, the environment was you know, simple derivative products, relatively simple modeling, relatively low risk, and low volume of transactions. So it was perfectly manageable to do everything in Excel. Uh, and um, actually, there's, um, there's quite a lot of um, advantages to using Excel. So the first one is we have an immutable programming model, something we've been hearing about today um, from a few different people, that um, if we program using an immutable style, uh, we, can, uh, we can get some benefits in terms of robustness, um, multi-threading, et cetera. You know, this wasn't a uh, consideration 15 years ago in Excel. But um, the, the key point here, I think, is that it got, got us very used to that, that model of immutable programming, because that's how Excel works. If you have side effects, um, then you, 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 your lost Excel doesn't, doesn't work properly. And the code is very simple because of that as well. We also have interactive development. This is, this is um, you know, you can type something in Excel in a cell, and then it calculates based on the values there. You get a result immediately. So this is important for iterative development. And we can actually build tool user interfaces using Excel um, at the same time as building the underlying model. So it's got some, um, definitely some, some advantages. Uh, but plenty of disadvantages. So how do we reuse code when we're just using Excel? Right? I'm just talking about the, um, the spreadsheet here, not you know, going into VBA or anything else. Um, so there's no way to, you have to copy and paste code, right? So that has obvious negative implications for, for maintainability, correctness, uh, and abstraction. Uh, we can't define data types. Um, it's not very fast for complex calculations. Uh, and, and so you know, it didn't, didn't, didn't last us very long just doing Excel on its own. So it's, some short period of time later, again, before my time um, in the group, uh, we introduced XLLs. So this is the, the plug-in architecture for Excel, where you, um, you write something in C++ or C, and then you can expose some functionality, reuse it everywhere. So this, this has a, a number of advantages. You know, we can obviously reuse code. We get better maintainability. And we can uh, define data types um, in C++. Not only that, but we can return them back to Excel, kind of, as a, we can return a handle back to them uh, to Excel, we, so we get kind of complex data in Excel cells. Um, 
I think the really interesting thing here, which is a, a model that's taken us a really long way up to this point, is that we were forced into a immutable OO model here. So if you return an object back to Excel, you cannot mutate that state. You, cannot, you can use it in downstream code. You can get, ask it to calculate things. You can query data from it. But you can't mutate the state uh, because it will stop Excel working. So this is something that people are talking about quite a lot now in the, in the, sort of the general programming world to deal with, deal with multi-threading. Um, this, again, this wasn't really a consideration at the time, but it is, this approach has served us quite well over um, the intervening years. Uh, and, and we generally uh, do this by, you know, we'll, we'll create an instance of a class and then we'll you know, maybe mess with it for some period of time, um, mutate its state from one thread, and then we can share it on multiple, th share it between threads as long as, long as we're using it in an immutable way. So we don't get language support in C++ for dealing with this, clearly. Um, there are still plenty of cons um, with, this, with this setup. Um, the main one that, that sort of came up um, shortly after doing it was, or relatively shortly after doing it, was we can't, um, C++ doesn't have a binary compatibility standard, so you can't pass, if you have multiple add-ins, multiple XLLs, you can't pass an, an object from one XLL to another um, because there's no binary standard for what that object looks like and you therefore can't change it unless all your add-ins are consistent. And for agility, release agility, we need to be able to um, we need to be able to re-release those XLLs individually as, as quickly as, as we need to. So that led us to um, an exchange, which is introducing a layer of COM uh, and C++. So this basically makes um, the, the XLLs kind of a thin layer, and everything else is, is uh, um, COM objects. So COM um, is a fairly old technology. This, we did this sort of 10 years ago, um, where uh, you know, Microsoft defined this, this, this standard so that you can, you can have a binary standard layer on top of um, classes, whether they're in, written in C++ or Visual Basic or any other kind of language. And um, this enables us to pass those objects around between DLLs. You can call them from a variety of different languages. So um, this was kind of a, a quite a positive change. Um, and, and it allowed us to introduce abstraction, um, which was you know, abstraction between the DLLs. Clearly, we could use C++ features before this, but this allowed us to kind of pass objects around and, and, and deal in our spreadsheets in terms of abstractions and build a lot of um, re reusable, composable units. Um, one interesting thing that happened just sort of just as I was um, arrived in the group, which was um, around about eight and a half years ago, was we, we started doing some real functional programming, I guess, in the sense that one of the abstractions we had in this model was, was the abstraction of a function, you know, a first class function value. And um, we had, a, a, when I joined, a limited set of uh, higher order functions. Uh, and some, so, so we did, could do basic functional programming in, in the spreadsheet. And that was you know, quite powerful in, in, in you know, the, the more we can do in the higher layers in this, in this diagram, the faster we can turn things around. So um, if we can make a change in Excel that composes together things in a slightly different way, then that's, that's, that's good for us without making that code too complex and, and unmaintainable. Uh, of course, there are disadvantages. If we want to define functions, we have to go down into C++, right? So we can use the functions, we can use the abstractions, but we can't define functions. And COM in C++ is pretty horrendous in terms of difficulty of development and, and how error prone it is for the memory management requirements. So that was kind of a, you know, it was a bad thing to have to keep doing that. And you have to go through a fairly long period of sort of testing and checking you, haven't, you aren't corrupting memory, et cetera, whenever you change that. And the code is, is not very concise either. And, and we lost quite a bit of the rapid turnaround um, interactive development that we, that we got inside Excel, except when we can do the things in Excel. So what do we do next? So we introduced um, our first um, sort of real proprietary functional programming technology. We did this about six years ago. Uh, and this was called um, FISH for functions in sheets. And this was the first iteration of this. So this allows a definition of functions in Excel as, as worksheets. So you lay things out as, as a calculation, as if you're operating on um, concrete values. And then you, um, our tool dynamically captures the calculation and then, and then um, turns it into a function. And it then has the same kind of function object abstraction that we can pass around in a spreadsheet. Uh, and we, um, we kind of, by doing this, we got our interactive development back, right? In, 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 at least in certain circumstances where we just needed to find a new fairly complex function and, and reuse it in, in a bunch of places. So we can just type this thing into Excel. The language, that there's, there's this fish thing for defining things directly in spreadsheets. And we defined a language that we um, rather um, cleverly called Lambda, um, which was uh, a Lambda expression language. 
Um, and this is basically Excel formula syntax with let bindings and named arguments and a few other kind of very basic extensions, but no kind of real module system or anything like that. Um, this allowed us to, uh, as well, to kind of define sort of standard valuation model abstraction. So we can say this product is defined in, this product is valued in this way, and then that abstraction can be used outside of Excel as well. So this is not, not an Excel-specific technology. Um, we introduced as well a, um, a, a powerful, rich set of higher-order functions. So we kind of took the Haskell prelude, which we were sort of learning Haskell at the time, um, and took the most important functions from there, kind of translated them into the equivalent things in, in, our, in this world, and we, um, uh, and we then built those and made them available in the spreadsheet. So we've had, you know, we did this kind of you know, five, six years ago, so people in our group have been using um, folds, maps, scans, etc., zip, zip with all those kind of things for um, a, large num a fairly large number of years. And, and, like, and this is not just the, the quants in our group who are kind of applied, applied mathematicians, but traders as well, who, who would build these things themselves and, and actually still do. Um, the other neat thing is we can take these functions that we write in the spreadsheet and we can just multi-thread them, right? So we've got, we're now in a point six years ago where we had probably four core machines and with decent speed, or you know, probably four processors or, or dual core or something. Um, we can use those, um, those CPUs. Uh, and that's dependent on the function's having no side effects, right? So again, it's like very important that this is functional, no side effects, immutable OO, we're making calls on, on objects, um, but that, that's fine, it, uh, none of those are mutating state. And we can also distribute the calculations onto a farm, because we know, because you know, when, you have a re when you just have a function, you've got some inputs, you've got some outputs, you can see the data dependencies. You know exactly what you need to send to the farm to do the computation. And so you can have 100 machines, um, you know, or, you know, 800 CPUs and send a function to, to map over a data set and it will compute, generally speaking, you know, 100 times faster, uh, so, or 800 times faster if you've got that many cores. Uh, so with a small amount of overhead, it, it enables us to do that kind of stuff. So it's, it was a very powerful um, tool set and, and extremely, extremely popular. Um, and again, all critically dependent on the immutable programming style. Um, there, there's still you know, a whole bunch of disadvantages of this that led us to um, uh, kind of do things, uh, just decide to make a change a few years ago. So obviously this is very proprietary and we have to have people who um, know how to um, develop and maintain the, the language and runtime. Um, we, we did hire some um, uh, programming language specialists um, after we started doing this and they sort of uh, uh, helped us do this in a slightly saner way. But typically when you, when you do this kind of stuff, build your own language, um, general purpose programming language, you, you make a whole bunch of mistakes that have been made millions of times before when people have written programming languages. And, and so it's, you know, we, we learned, I, I guess, that it's not, you know, it's best not to do this if you don't have to. Um, we also have to have our own debugger, which was, um, you know, which actually kind of just expanded out the calculation in, in Excel um, rather than being a regular debugger. You know, you don't have to deal with mutating state. You just kind of expand out the calculation for a given set of inputs and then you can see what's going wrong. Um, but it's all proprietary stuff, right? And we had to define a limited mod uh, module system and standard library functions, had to maintain all that stuff ourselves. Uh, and the code that, we're, that, is, that became a fairly big chunk of our code base was buried in spreadsheets for the most part. So if I want to find, I find a bug in a function in one of my comm servers or, or, DL, or XLLs, and I want to go and fix it, I want, to know where, I want to know where it's used, I might need to make a breaking change. I've really got you know, relatively little chance of, um, of doing this, which is quite unfortunate. Um, so if, I'm, if I've got C++ code or any code I've checked into my source control repository, I can grep in the repository right and find the use of the function. It's, it's, it's easy. <clears throat> and it doesn't scale up particularly well to building large numbers of valuation models. Uh, we had to build, um, we, we were in the process you know, a few years ago of migrating all of our trading books as the number of transactions got so big that managing them in Excel was you know, a serious issue. Um, we, we moved them all into systems and we had to, um, build hundreds of valuation models for hundreds of different product types uh, in these sort of prepackaged forms. And this kind of approach didn't scale up particularly well. And we didn't have any work. Yeah, language wasn't that powerful. We couldn't actually define data types. We can only use the ones that we have in, in C++. So you know, it was um, still fairly limited. So this is what led us to, um, uh, to use F Sharp. We started doing this two and a half years ago. Um, around the time that it was announced that F Sharp would become a productionized language and would be fully supported, et cetera. Uh, we didn't wait until to use it until that was the case, but we 
you know, the, the fact that it was going to be fully, fully supported gave us the confidence to start using it. Um, so we can now, we built a framework in F-sharp so we can um, use it essentially in place of this fish lambda um, setup. Um, we don't write the code in Excel, we write it in a source control system, but we can build it interactively with F-sharp Interactive. We can ship the things out as, as DLLs quite easily. Um, and all of this stuff is, is built by um, someone else, right? So we don't have to maintain it. And it's a much, much more powerful language, clearly. Um, and you know, it, we have an, a nice fusion of functional and object-oriented programming in, in F-sharp. So I don't believe functional is a way to do everything. And I, and I don't believe OO is the way to do everything. And in, in F-sharp, you can pick the appropriate uh, model for what you're, what you're, what you're actually doing. Um, it's fair to say you know, functional is, is definitely um, emphasized in, in F-sharp, but um, we, tend to, you know, we tend to use functional with sprinklings of OO, particularly you know, kind of immutable OO. And that, that is a combination that works really well and doesn't sacrifice the um, sort of multi-threading uh, uh, capabilities you get if you, if you keep in an immutable style. And we can also use our XLLs here, so we can make calls into the underlying XLLs um, very naturally. Um, and com servers, we get all this stuff in, in .NET. Um, it's great as for a language for composition. That's essentially what we use it for. We're composing together these lower level pieces of um, C++ com code. Um, and we obviously write a lot of code directly in F-sharp, but we also use it for composition. Uh, we built you know, a whole bunch of libraries that help us do this. We have hundreds of thousands of lines of code now. You know, like I said, we have 100 plus people working on it. Um, the numerically intensive code, most of it is still in C++, but we were able, because we, those pieces are quite, um, quite composable units, we're able to compose them together in, in F-sharp. What are the cons of this? Um, not a whole lot. I mean, you know, it's harder to find people with, um, with F-sharp skills, clearly, than, than C++ or C-sharp. Um, but we've, found, we've had good experience with taking, particularly people from the applied math background, which is the kind of background we hire for most of, most of our quants, they typically learn F-sharp quite easily. Um, and people who do have a C-sharp background takes them a little bit longer. They have to kind of unlearn, um, unlearn stuff, but, but you know, they, they definitely, uh, they're definitely able to do it. And the other thing, I guess, you know, fairly minor thing, you know, performance is not great when you kind of do interop between managed and unmanaged code, which we, we have to kind of work around. But otherwise, it, it, works, um, yeah, it all works extremely well. And the latest thing we're doing um, is... Um, well, to start with, we've, you know, radic the size of these blocks is not representative. Like F sharp is now, like the, I guess, half of our code base, and um, probably 70% of the coding people do, um, probably more than that. Um, but we're, what we're doing um, now is building tools in F sharp and using um, WPF, which is Microsoft's uh, UI framework. Uh, this is you know, built on some useful concepts that fit well with how we do things in, in F sharp. So there's kind of a strict separation of the view layer and the model. The view is coded um, in kind of declaratively in a language called XAML, which is not, you know, is XML. So not particularly nice to necessarily code in, but you can design these things in a designer tool as well. So um, you don't necessarily have to write the, the XAML. Um, and you get, you know, very, very customizable views. So we can build really compelling tools for our, um, for our users. So this is something we've been doing for about a year, a year now we've started a project to do this. It's, it's sort of still in the um, development stage to kind of really scale this up. But this is our plan to have um, you know, more use of F-sharp and WPF so that kind of the use of Excel is, is getting smaller. Um, one interesting thing, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about this, but the view model layer, which is essentially the model underneath that does all the calculations, uh, we build this in F-sharp. And really the, the main hard thing about building one of these um, components is that um, Users expect a responsive UI, right, which they typically don't get in Excel, but they get it in some way. So in Excel, if you change an input um, and only some subset of the calculations in your sheet are de uh, dependent on that change, they're the only things that get recalculated, which is not the normal model when you kind of modularize code, right? You kind of re redo everything. Um, so um, people expect that responsive calculation. Um, and we would like the UI, we'd like to improve on Excel by making everything um, asynchronous and, and kind of implicitly parallelized at the level, uh, at some level. So we actually built a dependency graph-based calculation engine in F-sharp um, so that we just, we parameterize this engine with closures um, that, that are executed at various nodes in the graph. This represents the, the graph of dependencies between inputs and outputs. And then we can just um, recalculate only the minimum set, you know, the minimum chain between 
um, the inputs and the outputs they um, uh, that, that they depend on or that are dependent on them, and we can parallelize any parallel chains in that in that graph as well. And this this worked um, extremely well. Um, again, completely dependent on side effect free functions, um, which was not really a big deal for us because we're, we're very much used to that. Um, but it does give you, you know, going that way, immutable OO side effect free functions really gives you a lot of uh, a lot of benefits in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, we implemented this using the F# -sharp async um, model, which is you know, asynchronous workflows. I'm going to show you a little bit of code in a minute, and you'll, you'll see that. Um, I'm not going to show you this code, but I'm going to show you something kind of similar. And we also get, hence the name, we also get asynchrony, right? So you, users make a change, and, and then you know, they're not, the UI is not frozen up while they're doing that. You can interact with it while things are being calculated. OK, so that's kind of what we do. Um, I thought it would be useful to talk about, um, given the audience, what do we need from students, right? So we, we do hire people on a very regular basis. Uh, we hire, um, I guess our group you know, depends on the business environment. We hire between um, you know, five and 20 people a, a year, right, out, out of college, um, usually out of PhD programs, but also master, master's level. Uh, so I thought it would be useful to kind of talk about the things that we would really like um, a broader spectrum of, of individuals to, to, uh, to have experience and knowledge in. And this is not just important in F Sharp. So C Sharp um, developers massively benefit from all of these things, knowing about all of these things as well. And most of them don't. Um, and Scala, Haskell, you know, less, less widely used, but they're, you know, they're, they're still all dependent on these things. So um, functional data types. So you know, people know about, people come out of college typically know about um, classes, and um, they don't necessarily know about the, the sort of the, the standard um, fundamental data types, you know, sum and product types. Um, so that's discriminated unions and, and, and records or tuples, essentially. Uh, they don't necessarily know about pattern matching, right? So these are like fundamental things that give you um, very, t you know, tools that are very powerful to quickly, quickly build um, models of data and, and process them. Um, we expect people to know about type inference, right? And, and the type inference is different from dynamic typing. I think probably, I don't know, 60, 70% is my guess of C-sharp developers. I'm sure when they see var, which is the you know, type inferred type in, in, in C-sharp, I'm sure they think it's dynamically typed. Um, we really need people to know about it. It's like a really basic thing. And they need to know about you know, basically how does type inference work? What are the, what are the limits? Um, it's, you know, that's, that's like a really important thing. Um, parametric polymorphism. Um, you know, people don't understand um, subtype polymorphism um, typically, but not so much what you can do easily with parametric polymorphism. Maybe monads is getting a bit advanced, but you know, in C sharp and F sharp, there's there's a reason about monadic stuff. And if you're doing some more advanced programming, like understanding um, what monads are is, is is helpful. And the standard set of high order functions, right? So I'd like students to know. Um, what a map, a fold, a scan, et cetera, are, and how you, write, how you might write various kinds of algorithms using those combinators. And the characteristics of pure functional algorithms. So you know, there's a lot of, been a lot of study of certain algorithms uh, and you know, their complexity, and they're mainly focused on algorithms that mutate state. Um, there are sometimes or often functional, pure functional equivalents. They may have different characteristics. Some of those characteristics are, um, are good. And some are not particularly good, right? So they may be, they may be slower, um, but they may be more parallelizable. They may give you kind of persistent data so you can look at older versions of things, et cetera. So, so they, it's, it's worth um, people knowing about what pure functional algorithms look like. And the other thing is concurrency and parallelism. This is more on the, um, you know, I guess, the practical end of things. These, uh, these functional programming fundamentals, this is really where I'd like people to have a, a strong understanding of the you know, programming language theory in this, in this space, right? And there's, there's not such a massive gap in the space between programming language theory and, and practice in these kind of languages. In concurrency, there's like probably a bigger gap because you know, there isn't really like a, there are a bunch of usable concurrency paradigms in real languages, but I think most people agree we haven't really got there yet. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, whereas I think we're in a better, a better situation in terms of um, uh, type theory and, and the basics of, of, um, of programming. So in the concurrency and parallelism space, um, you know, I'd like people to understand what asynchronous programming is, what continuations are, and how um, we can build up particularly I/O bound programs using um, using using an asynchronous model. Um, thread pools, how we can sort of schedule things on a thread thread pool instead of explicit threading, kind of 
what are the good, you know, what are the good ways to do that? Um, data parallel versus task parallel approaches. So you know, data parallel approaches are gaining traction due to processor architectures like GPUs that work best on data parallel problems, and you know, I'd like people to understand um, what what the um, what the differences are and what you can do easily with each each model, and the difference between scalability and performance. Right, I think there's a lot of focus on um, how do I make this algorithm perform well, but you know, it's very different from how does it perform well when it's running on a server with a hundred other people doing doing the same thing. Right, so that's that's an important thing, I think, and um, we we kind of don't see that so much from from people who don't have a lot of experience. Uh, and I think a key point is I like people to have an appreciation that there's really one right way to do things. So people who do come out of um, computer science programs with a strong empathy with functional programming, um, sometimes they are like very, very passionate about it to the point they think it's the only way and everything should be done with functional programming. And I'm a believer that there's, you know, there's really one best way to do, to do everything. Um, there's often plenty of bad ways to do things. Um, but there's really one right way. So you know, there's various different approaches, functional versus OO, declarative versus imperative. Um, you, these things, there's always a balance for a particular, um, a particular use case, right? So you've got to have something where you can, you can the code can be, you, know, you might have really concise code, but can people understand it? Is it too abstract? Right? Abstraction is good, but it, is your code too abstract? You've got to be able to look at it and actually have an idea of, of what it's doing. And you've got to be able to de debug it, right? And if you do things that, like completely crazily translate your program so it's impossible to step through it in a debugger, um, which you, you, know, you still will need to do even, even in, uh, when you write functional code. You, you have to do it less often, but you still typically have to do it. Um, expressive, expressiveness of the type system is another thing. So F sharp sort of, I think, goes, there's a fine line in F sharp between expressiveness of the type system and how easily they can produce good error messages. And, and, and in the case of F sharp, how well does it map to the .NET type system? Um, if, if you look at a language like Haskell, it's got a much more expressive type system, and that's generally a good thing, but if the error message you get when you do something wrong is a call of the library is three pages long, then it's not a good thing, right? It might be much better to get an error at um, runtime that tells you exactly what went wrong. So I think that's, again, it's like there's a spectrum there, and in different use cases, it, 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 well, different things make sense. Okay, so now I'm going to um, do a little demo. Um, does everyone remember the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? So this is um, uh, this is a, a um, uh, based on I think originally some social network experiments that kind of posited that every individual in the world could be connected through at most six degrees of separation. And Kevin Bacon apparently said that he had once in in the nineties that he'd worked with everybody in Hollywood or someone who's worked with them. So we're going to um, look at some code that tests out whether Kevin is, is actually um, actually correct. Um, so this is not something we typically do in a, in a quantitative modeling group. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it does demonstrate a couple of techniques that we use fairly extensively in our code base. And it's something that I can actually show you a small amount of code, and it will kind of, kind of make sense. And we're going to do this using the, um, um, the Netflix OData API. So, so Don talked about using OData APIs. This is going to be done without the benefit of uh, the cool new um, secret source in new version of F sharp. But we're going to. So you're going to see what it, will, what it would have looked like back in the old days, which are now for us. Um, OK, let me just flip to, hopefully you can see my, or not, oh, one screen, OK. That's not awesome. Let me try that. Okay. Does anyone know how to fix this? Is this only coming on one screen? Ah. Let me just try this one. Hang on a second. No. Is that better? <laughs> How did we fix that before? Oh, hang on, let me. No, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, I'm not going to touch anything. All right, so um, you may, this code may look familiar because this was an example of the nasty code you have to write when you're consuming dynamically da um, typed um, data um, from F sharp and you want to map it into a, into a strongly typed 
um, system, which is, you know, when I'm doing this kind of stuff, it's exactly the first thing I want to do, right? I'm, I'm not going to be writing JSON parsing, which is what the API um, gives you. So I want to map this onto some strongly typed data. So um, what you typically do is, um, well, there, there are ways, a couple of ways of doing this, but you, you can define, you know, an F-sharp data type that reflects the data you're interested in, and then you can use some features in the .NET runtime to, to generate a, a serializer from that, or a deserializer from that dynamically. We do this in a bunch of different um, contexts, in a bunch of different ways. So typically using our own code rather than the .NET library, but I'm just using the .NET library here. It requires me to decorate things with these, these things that I don't really want to do uh, in, in, our, in our real code base. <coughs> so um, the other thing we do here is we, we do do code generation as well. So when we're calling our XLLs from F Sharp, we generate wrap, strongly typed wrappers that let us call the XLLs, which have a dynamically typed API. Um, so we will set, certainly, in a bunch of different ways, we will benefit from um, the work in, uh, being done in, in, uh, in F Sharp um, 3. Um, and we also consume and generate XML and relational stuff. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of very common. This is, this is stuff we do, we do all the time. And typically, my sort of core part of the group will write the code that sort of deals with these data types and then, um, and then you know, write some generic code that, that deals with processing those and generating on the fly air parts. And we typically don't code gen when, when we're doing this kind of stuff, but we, um, we kind of generate, um, we compose closures together that, that will we'll do the parsing in, uh, instead of generating code. It's just kind of a different technique. Um, and then modelers will be just writing these data structures. If they say, my trade data looks like this, they just kind of write a, a type. And then all their downstream processing of their trade data is in terms of these strong types, uh, which, which definitely improves the um, reliability of the code for sure. Before, when we were doing this, we would do kind of a lot of dynamic stuff and XML, manual XML processing before we were using F Sharp for this. That's so pretty nasty. And then the way we kind of consume that, we've got another kind of thing. This might look familiar to, uh, um, to you from Don's talk. So we use a data contract serializer. We have to mess around downloading it, putting it in streams, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we put, a, we put a strongly typed wrapper around it. So I've got this function that says, given I'm saying the schema of the expected data is this, I can um, call this and get a function back which will convert a string into this, um, into this type. And then we can just have some uh, yeah, we can use this for, to get our results. OK, so what am I going to do um, to test out Kevin Bacon? So um, I've got two names. It doesn't have to be Kevin Bacon. I've got one name, uh, one actor, and then another name of another actor. And I'm going to get the, find that person if I can and get the, the full details from the Netflix API, which requires a couple of calls to OData service, get back this person object. And I'm going to um, try finding a direct connection, then try finding a um, indirect connection. I, would, I originally did this recursively, which would have been much nicer, but I found that if, if I do it recursively, I'll like, kill the Netflix uh, OData service, and it, it cuts me off. So uh, we're, we're going to do at most uh, two levels of separation. So there are limits to what you can practically do. So I'm going to, before I go through the rest of the code, I'll just show you this. Um, I've got a simple um, uh, C sharp uh, wrapper around this that, that kind of given the, the call to, to get the connection, it gets back this result, and then it, and then it populate, it draws a graph of it. So this is like a small amount of code, and it's mainly using um, uh, XAML, which is you know, the, the UI framework. So if I, um, um, if I have um, Kevin Bacon, and then can someone give me the name of another actor? Not one that's really obscure, because they have to be connected by at most two degrees of separation. Al Pacino, okay. Let's hope I can spell his name. Al Patri Pacino, okay. So I click Find, and my UI is. You know, this is now calling the Netflix service, but you know, my now my UI is frozen up, right? So I haven't done anything anything with async or anything, right? I'm just calling the Netflix API, and if we pray a little bit and hope the web service is working, um, we find that Al Pacino was in Simone with Evan Rachel Wood, who was in Digging to China with Kevin Bacon. So there you go. I never would have known that. <laughs> so Kevin's right. He is, he is, um, we have not disproved him yet. Um, but we haven't got a very good application because those, those calls, we had to make a few calls to the Netflix service, took a few seconds, and I couldn't you know, do anything with my um, user interface. I might have been wanting to sort of move things around. I might, I might have been you know, wanting to look at this in a, a different way or something. And I don't know. 
uh, if it's a more general user interface, I would have had other, other facilities in there I might want to use. So that's not great. So why, is it, why does it hang up? Well, the reason is um, pretty simple. We're running everything on one thread, and everything is synchronous code, right? So I make the call in here. The UI thread you know, the met can't pump messages, can't do anything. So we have to fix that. And this is one of the use cases for F-sharp async. Um, the basic, so the basic way um, you use F-sharp async is like a fairly simple translation of regular code. Um, I'm assuming most people haven't seen async, so I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of info on, on kind of how it works. So we can make our function async by putting, making it an async block. And then we, can, we have to return. OK, so this is now not a regular function. This is a function that returns an async of the, the value. Um, this is not going to do anything asynchronously, because um, all this means is I can, this, is, this has now represented the computation here um, as, a, um, as a value that I can do some stuff with. Like I can, I can go and run it on another thread, or I can run it synchronously. So I'm going to make this um, oops, a private function. And then I'm going to transform. I'm going to change the function that my uh, C sharp calls. so that it um, can be invoked asynchronously. So asynchrony is usually based on continuations. So we can, we'll call this API from C sharp. We'll pass in the parameters, and then we'll pass in continuations for what to do when um, the, the operation completes. So we're going to um, say, OK, we're going to have the result continuation. And this is going to be an action. This is a .NET type that represents function that returns unit. I'm not going to let F sharp determine the, the types there. And I'm going to have an error continuation, uh, which is an action. Um, and I'm also going to let the F-sharp uh, compiler and figure out the types there. And then I'm going to call, this is a useful thing in um, asynchronous programming, um, async um, uh, start. There's a whole bunch of things you can do here. So start with continuations is what we're taking the async, triggering it off, and then when it's finished, we call one of the continuations. So the first parameter is the um, is the function I'm going to call. Uh, the next thing is going to be result const.invoke. So that, that gets me back a regular function from the uh, continuation. And then the next one is the error, what to do in the case of an error, and what to do in the case of ca cancellation, which I'm just going to treat as an error. OK. Uh, this will. This will still not actually be asynchronous because we're still running a start with continuations runs it on the current thread. So it might, it could be asynchronous um, if we're not actually using the CPU the whole time, which we're going to deal with in a second. Um, but I'm going to um, just flip back to my C sharp and change it. So instead of doing this, we're going to pass in the actions, which are set result, the same function as I'm calling below, and uh, service error. And then that's that. And then that's going to tell me it doesn't compile because it hasn't yet compiled the F-sharp. <coughs> and I'm not going to run this because it's going to have exactly the same behavior as before, because we're running it kind of asynchronously, but it's one block of um, sequential code, so it's not actually going to relinquish control. So we need to make it, for things to be really asynchronous, we actually need to relinquish control. So the way we do that in, in F-sharp is um, in the case of the async um, workflow, is we use the bang operators, right? So if you, if you do let bang, what that means is go and do this asynchronous operation on the right-hand side. And then when it's done, pass the rest of the computation as a continuation. So it's like a, a, a nice rewriting of your code, completely automatic. Um, this requires the operation of, is async, which it isn't. Find full person is not an asynchronous operation. Um, to make it asynchronous, we have to go down to um, what we're actually doing asynchronously, which is find full person, async. So this is kind of a cascading thing. Um, these, these find person and get task titles and cast, these are the things that are actually making the calls to the web service. So they need to be async too. Um, we need to do return here. We have to go to find person. We have to make that async. And then the important thing here, this is the actual asynchronous operation. Let bang client.download string has to be async. And then we can return the result. 
and that one's now async. Let's make this one async. So you can see this is, you know, once you get used to doing this kind of stuff, you look for the actual asynchronous operations. Um, this is like a fairly mechanical translation and not too hard to do once you understand what's, what's going on. And of course, this model of computation expressions that transforms your, your workflow into some blob of code plus a continuation is powerful for a whole range of other reasons, right? You can do all sorts of things with this. Async is just one, one application. So if, I, if I'm lucky, then this will compile. If I'm unlucky, I will get a type error, and then uh, we'll be happy. OK, so that succeeded. I need another actor. Um, nothing with apostrophes in it. <laughs> I haven't got very sophisticated building of the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the query string. So let's, uh, let's have another one. Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Let's hope uh, he's done something recently. So now um, you can see this is doing stuff, and it's, um, and it's now it's responsive. And I've got a little progress bar, which I never had before. I actually did have before, but it never showed me it because wow. it never got to um, uh, display it. So Paul Newman was in, um, let's see, uh, was in, what's this? Harper with Robert Wagner, who was in Wild Things with Kevin Bacon. So there you go. <laughs> Who would have thought it? So the interesting thing here is this is asynchronous, right? And, and I can now interact with the user interface, but everything is running, running on one thread. So there's no multi-threading here. So this, this can be useful if you want to mutate state, right? Because in a user interface, you typically do want to mutate state. Um, we tend to try to limit the state mutating things to kind of the UI level, and everything else is kind of immutable. But it can be nice to just be running on, on, on one thread. And it, make, it can make the whole thing more scalable. If you end up right, spawning thousands of threads, that can, um, it, when you're doing something, it can be um, not particularly scalable. So this only works because we're I/O bound, right? So if we were doing something CPU bound, we'd, we'd want to use um, we want to use threads. But it's still not wonderful. So you know, we have um, you know, oh, I think it's now it's made one request. It's, it's fast, but the first request is loading up some DLLs, it's resolving DNS addresses that actually hung for like a second or something. So um, it wasn't. Wasn't wonderful. Let's try it again. Let's have another actor just to, to end with. Meryl Streep. I'm glad no one has come up with a name of an actor that I can't spell. <laughs> OK, so again, this is all, yeah, it's async. But it's all running on the UI thread, so it's, uh, there you go. Oh, they, they were both in the, the River Wild. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so it can handle one degree of separation as well. So if we have concluded that Kevin Bacon is correct. He, is, um, he has worked with everyone in Hollywood or, or someone who's worked with them. So it's, uh, we've achieved what we set out to do. Um, and we've also achieved you know, translating some regular sequential code into something that runs asynchronously using, using a, only one thread. And if we wanted to, we could do some stuff easily that makes it faster. Like um, you know, I'm, when, I, when I get these people, um, Sorry, I'm now. Oh, it's too late now. I've closed the, closed the application now. Uh, so here we've got, um, you know, we've got two things. These are going to happen one after the other, right? So I can do, I can overlap this I/O. Um, so I can do, um, you know, async dot, uh, what is it? Start child. And then these things are now. What this does is it starts it off and gives me um, an async, and then I have to do another to block on the, well not block, but actually this does not block, but um, to await the, the finishing of the, that. And I'm just rebinding the same names there, which some people don't like, but it just, so these are now person and person. So that will make the thing um, uh, run on um, background threads. And I'm hoping, so there is, a, there is a potential issue. Once you start doing that, you have to make sure you, um, you, you resume the computation on the UI thread which I am uh, not 100% sure I'm going to. Well, let's find out. If it doesn't appear, then we will not be, we find out we're not in the UI thread. But we, it's actually very easy in, in async. If we want to switch um, to the thread pool, oh, there you go. If we switch to the thread pool and then back to the UI thread, you can do that simply with combinators. You can say do async.switch to thread pool, do async switch to context. You can then switch back to the UI thread. So it's got some 
powerful ways of actually kind of moving your computation between different execution contexts, which is, which is nice. And if you're using, um, doing something that's actually compute bound, you do that kind of stuff uh, much more. Any, anyone got any questions on the async stuff before I leave this code? OK. All right, so that's basically um, uh, all I had to say. Um, I'll just put up this uh, oh, Credit Suisse disclaimer slide. <laughs> Hang on, let me. Uh, just in case you misconstrued anything that I was, uh, I was talking about. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Wow, that was quite something. I hope you all followed that because I did. <laughs> okay, questions. <laughs> the, that that tool, um, if you really want, yeah. <laughs> it's not that clever, so. Uh. <laughs> Other ones? So I've got a I've got a short question. Um, how many people have you had coming into your bank who've actually had the skills that you needed that you listed? Um, I'd say probably about uh, order of 10, something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, good. So fairly small number who came from, they were typically Haskell programmers who uh -huh. had a you know, functional programming background in academia. Um, and um, yeah, they, they were, it was quite easy for them to uh, adapt to doing, doing F sharp. Um, but you know, we haven't had a, we haven't had a difficult time getting um, the applied mathematicians to, to learn F sharp anyway. So for the, for the quants, it's not really a big deal. For our core team that has to do the kind of more sophisticated stuff on the computer science, science software engineering side, it's more, more of a challenge. Well, I guess everyone wants to go home. Right. <laughs> OK, so thank you again. Thank you. And uh, well, we've got some chocolate to pick up. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. All right, so um, I'm standing between you and dinner, and I'm not going to stand very long. I want to thank everybody very, very much for coming here. Uh, it's been amazing how interactive you've all been and how much I've heard in the passageways and so on. I presume one of the things we need to talk about is what we're going to do after this as a community because Don is very, very keen that we should continue to grow our community. So we have all your names. We will be sending you out the precise places where you can find uh, the exact websites to go to and uh, what the community uh, links and so forth are going to be. Just you'll hear from us. Meantime, keep learning about F Sharp. If you want to do anything really specific, like write books, write courseware, and so on, contact me at Microsoft. We can talk about that. My email is jbishop at microsoft.com, easy one. Or you can contact Don as well, dsime at microsoft.com, easy one. And uh, I think that we really are at the beginning of something. It's quite likely that we'll have another uh, workshop some other time. And I hope that if we do so, we'll see all you great people there. Thank you. <laughs>